Now was the winner of our discontent. Made glorious summer by this son of York. And all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths. Our bruised arms hung up for monuments. Our stern alarms changed to merry meetings. Our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front. And now, instead of mountain barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. Senor Antonio, many a time and often a Rialto, you rated me about my monies and my usances. Still, I've borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and spat upon my Jewish gabardine, and all for the use of that which is mine own. Well, then, it now appears you need my help. Go to, then. You come to me and you say, Shylock, we would have monies. You say so. <laughs> you that did board your room upon my beard and foot me as you would spurn a stranger cur over your threshold. What should I say to you? Should not I say, Hath a dog money? The Seven Ages of Man by William Shakespeare all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. His acts be in seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, and then the whining schoolboy, with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress eyebrow. And the soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick and quarrel seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly with good cape and lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank and his big, manly voice turning again toward childish treble. Pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange, eventful history is second childishness, mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste. Sands everything. To be or not to be. That is a question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing in them to die to sleep no more and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to it is a consummation devoutly to be wished to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Ah, there's the rub. 
For in that sleep of death, <laughs> what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coal must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes. when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would fartles bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life? But that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country, Puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus, conscience doth make cowards of us all. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. <clears throat> I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after him. Good is often turred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it were a grievous fault. And grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here under the leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, and so are they all, all honorable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He has brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransom did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal, I thrice presented Caesar a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? <sighs> Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withhold you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart's in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till I come back to me.